happy to be here. And I'm very happy that we make that possible remotely. So let's talk about a nerdy topic, HTTP headers. Let's remove something here because something is bothering me. All right. And before we start, what I want to share with you is basically my journey on the web. And I was in the very lucky position that I had a tech-savvy father and I had an internet connection basically uh, in a fairly early age. So I'm now 34 and I started browsing the web probably when I was 12, 13, 14. But when the internet started, um, what was interesting there was I didn't actually know what to do in the internet. So we haven't had uh, search engines yet. In Germany, Lycos was a thing and I found myself entering URLs into the browser, but I actually didn't really know what to do with this thing called internet. So I was not really excited about it. Then in Germany, what happened was that this thing was released. It was called ubo.com. So usually I ask now who has used that. So I use that at least. Uh, this was the first attempt that I used in Germany to, that kind of was a social network. And there it was, 1999. This is where I grew up. This is in the north of Germany. Nothing going on there. But I found myself chatting to people from Berlin, mainly about music. And this was for the first time that I discovered that the web connects people. So when we now fast forward a little bit, uh, it turned out that I moved to Berlin. I started working in sound engineering because this is what you do when you're interested in music. And then 2010, uh, a change happened. So I was bored by sound engineering and I became a web developer. And then the whole... It sounds very big to say that my whole life changed, but the whole sentiment changed um, that the web connects people towards a new statement that I think is true today is that we connect people because I, I'm still amazed about programming and developing things because we have a lot of power. We can just build things with our computers. We enable people depending on what we build and we can help people. So let me just really introduce myself. I'm Stefan. Um, if you want to follow along with the slides, you can find them on uh, my dash links online. And yes, I own this domain. Uh, they're responsible dev. And so what I only want to say here is that, hey, I'm Stefan and I want to be a responsible developer. So let's have a look at a few statistics, not because I'm the biggest fan of statistics, but let's just have a quick look. This is where I started my journey. It was 1999. And when we now again fast forward to 2019 or 2020, um, where are actually the most uh, internet users are coming from? So they are coming from China, India, and the United States. And I hear you. Why should you care? Or why should I care? But let me tell you something. I also write on my private blog quite a little bit. And just looking at some analytics stats, you will find out that I had 400 people from Brazil uh, 150 people from Vietnam and 100 people from South Africa reading the stuff that I wrote on my little website. And I think this is absolutely amazing. But at the end, what I want to tell you is that this really should not matter because we should be building for everybody. And when you build for the web, you might still have these kind of discussions where someone says to you that we don't have users in a certain region of the world or we don't have users that are under a certain condition. I had these discussions a lot of times when responsive web design came up. It was always like, Stefan, this doesn't have to be responsive, right? Nobody uses that on their phone. But guess what? When you do these kind of statements, what you will find out is that you're creating a chicken and egg problem. Because when you're not building things for people under certain conditions, these people won't use the stuff that you built. And it is as easy as that. And building for the web today is actually not very easy today because you have to consider so many things. You have to consider design choices, color, uh, context, all these kind of things. Did you know that, for example, in certain areas of Asia, the meaning of red and green is inverted? So that green is something bad and red is something good? Good luck with this one. You have to ship proper content. You have to make it fast so that people, even on spotty connections, can use your things. You have to make it accessible so that the Google bot understands it, but also people using assistive technology can interact with the things you build. I'm a front-end engineer. You have to figure out what to, what to use in the first place, which is a very hard thing to do uh, today anyways. You have to optimize the network stack and you have to make it work on phones, cars, fridges, and whatever comes next. And what I want to talk about next in the 30 minutes that I have is the network layer. 
So let's talk about HTTP. So when you hit a URL bar into your browser, what happens is that your browser will send up a set, is, will send a set of key value peers, so-called request headers. This will then hit the server and the server will respond with another set of key value pairs, the response headers, and the resource that you responded, uh, that you requested. So what we're dealing with are request and response headers. So a few months ago, it was a trending to buy a .dev domain. So this is what I did. So what you see here is the responsible um, .dev. It is a website, there's not much in there, but you already see that JavaScript is disabled. So let's enable JavaScript and reload this one. You see a permission dialogue popping up, um, unicorns appear from somewhere, and you can also go to CodePen, which is an online code editor, and you can just frame this site in an iframe and pretend to be the responsible or deaf, and can maybe start uh, tracking clicks and doing some malicious stuff in there. So I asked myself the question, how can we use HTTP headers to make this site better without touching any source code? And to start this topic, what I want to tell you is that the web is a very, very scary place. Every now and then you kind of read these news that thousands of websites started, for example, to mine cryptocurrency because a third party was hacked. Or that, for example, open source projects um, give access to some maintainers and these maintainers then uh, do malicious code. For example, here we see the event stream in, in, uh, incident where, uh, where it was that millions of machines had code reading cryptocurrency wallets uh, on their machine. Uh, people had these on their machine. And this just happens. The JavaScript or the web development ecosystem is huge these days. And this gives us a lot of power, but it also is a little bit scary because we always rely on others. So when we're building for the web, I think that we should guarantee that the web is safe. And the first thing for a safe internet is HTTPS. So HTTPS is a secure connection, and it first of all prevents the hoodie hackers from interfering connections. So a person um, who knows how to spin up a public knife, uh, Wi-Fi and uh, uh, track all the connection going in and out can do that very, very easily. With HTTPS, this becomes way, way harder for people um, sniffing traffic. But also browser vendors push towards new cutting edge features to be only be available over uh, HTTPS, like HTTP2 and service workers or get user media. And I do front end stuff uh, for a living and I ship HTTPS for several years now. But then you can also go, for example, to a website like why no HTTPS. It's not 100% accurate anymore, but you will find big sites in there that in 2020 still do not ship HTTPS, which I think is very interesting. And for example, this one here, we have the ARD, which is a massive German news um, uh, organization. They're not shipping HTTPS by default. I think this is very surprising and I think we can do better. So what you can do is when you ship HTTPS in the first place, then what you can do is you can enable that it will always be a secure connection. And what you can do is on the server side is that you can set a strict transport security header. You can define in seconds how long this website should only work over HTTPS. And basically what happens then is that whatever happens, this site will go over a secure connection. You can broaden the scope of this using include subdomains, or if you feel fancy, you can say, you can add a preload directive. So what does preload mean in this context? When you uh, have preload enabled, you can go to this website, which is hstspreload.org, and you can submit your domain to this site. What happens then is that people will eventually check your request and your domain could end up in this JSON file that is included in the Chromium um, uh, source code. This is a long list of domains that should only work over HTTPS. And this list is propagated across browser vendors. So in case you ever wondered why .dev domains do not work over HTTP anymore, the reason is that .dev is included in this list. But HSTS is not only about web performance, uh, about web security, so it's also about web performance. When you, for example, um, sit in the Deutsche Bahn and you have spotty connection and you type a URL into the address bar, what happens first is that the browser will make an HTTP request. If the connection is not great, this could take two, three, four, five seconds just to receive a redirect to HTTPS. With HSTS, you can save this redirect 
and make your site more secure too. So how's the support for strict transport security? It's pretty green and you can use that today. So, but how do you deal with big projects and moving them to HTTPS in the first place? Usually you have a lot of assets, you have a lot of uh, content management systems in place, and just it's not that easy to just turn on HTTPS. What you can do is you can use content, the response header, content security policy upgrade and secure requests. And this header set on the server side will magically uh, make all the requests going out from your site going over an HTTPS connection. This is pretty cool if you want to migrate over to HTTPS. This is not the main purpose of content security policy, in short, CSP though. CSP is there to limit what is allowed in your website. And you can really nail it down. So you can define where scripts should be loaded from, where styles should be loaded from, what JavaScript is allowed to load. And everything else that is not whitelisted will be blocked. This can prevent you uh, and your visitors from mining cryptocurrency without knowing it. There are a few uh, still experimental things in there, but you can use that today. So how do you use that? You can either implement a meta element inside of your HTML. This could look like this, or you do it like I do for my site, uh, stefanjudis.com, which is your ship this header. And let me just tell you that this is not an easy header to come up with. So when you want to start shipping CSP, what I highly recommend doing is first ship this header. So this is again a response header and you should go with content security policy uh, report only first. This header uh, will enable the browser to pretend to running in CSP mode and instead of blocking resources, it will send uh, reports to a URI that you define. And then you can just measure, monitor what, should be, what would have been blocked and then when you feel safe at some point, you can make it, uh, you can turn it on completely. There's also a new header, which is called the report to header. You can set this response uh, header and define a JSON structure to really nail down what reports you want to get uh, and want to monitor. So you could monitor CSP violations, but you could also monitor for force with the network endpoint there. So this new report to header gives you a new way um, to monitor what is actually going on in your website. If you want to learn more about this report to header, um, you can check out the reporting API. So this is pretty much uh, Chromium universe right now, but the Chromium um, um, distribution is, what is it today, 70, 80%. So even if only Chromium supports it, um, this header could give you a lot of value for monitoring what is going on in your website. So, and if you did a little bit of CSP development and you look at all these white listings here, you may have probably spotted already a thing that is not great in here. And it's unsafe inline and unsafe evil. So this is basically a white listing in inline JavaScript. And why do I have that in there? The reason for that is that I'm using a JavaScript framework and this JavaScript framework has to inline some state so that the JavaScript knows what the HTML was generated with. So how could you in, uh, allow inline JavaScript? There are basically two ways. You could set as a script source a, a hashed value. So this will then depend on the content that you have in the inline script. This has one downside though, because now you have to change the header or the script source whenever you change the content in the script. So uh, you have to figure out if that is the approach that you want to follow. Or you can give it an ID property, a so-called nonce property. And with this, you can whitelist certain inline scripts, which is a nice way of dealing with uh, CSP stuff. So how's the support of CSP today? Uh, CSP is available in two levels. So CSP level one is pretty, pretty green. And CSP level two is a little bit bumpy still in, in, in Firefox, but you can still use that if you're not going completely cutting edge. And as this, as I think this is very important to prevent, for example, this cryptocurrency mining incident, uh, I had it over to HTTP archive. So in case you don't know, HTTP archive is the site that crawls the internet and um, aggregates basically and generates a huge data set with how the uh, most visited websites are built and how they look like technically. And what is cool about this is that you can then use to kind of play tools to play around with this data. So I asked myself the question, okay, how many pages are actually using CSP? And it turned out that it was only 6%. And I get it. Implementing CSP 
is not the easiest thing to do in the world, but I honestly think that we can do better to kind of prevent all these incidents. We cannot ship 100, 200, 300 third parties without having this safety net of CSP. So when you want to enable a CSP, you have to follow this one rule. It's like before, when you start, uh, enable it with report only, monitor, and only then go with a real CSP directive in your uh, headers because you will break things. And I broke my site three times before I really enabled CSP because I thought, well, I know all the stuff that is loaded. Usually you don't. So when you go to the responsible.dev slash safe, you will find out that the unicorns are gone because the malicious third party script um, was prevented to be loaded with CSP. And you will also see that when you want to frame this site using CodePend or any other uh, service, you will see that my CSP directives just disallowed this from happening which made this site a little bit more safer. And I think this is important because the web is crucial for people. And I hang out on Twitter quite a little bit and I more and more and more read these statements. Your stuff doesn't work in Africa. And now I live in Berlin and at least theoretically, I always have LTE and a fast mobile connection, right? But this is not true because I'm also traveling quite a little bit um, for work. And for example, this happens when I go to a, a country that is not in the European data contract or whatever this thing is. So this is my mobile provider called uh, my mobile provider U2. And they sent me, for example, a message when I go to the Ukraine that I get six megabytes for two euros. But, and this is like a joke, you have to use this in 24 hours. This is ridiculous. An average website today is between 1.5 and 3 meg or something. This holds me not even 10 minutes. And this now becomes even crucial for me when I'm uh, on an airport in Kiev and I want to figure out the number of a cab or something like this. And I honestly think that the web has to be affordable. And one thing to make the web more affordable is to don't request the same content over and over again. And cache and cache invalidation is one of the hard problems in computer science, so I just want to briefly mention it. When you ship your assets, please set a proper cache control response header. This will tell the browser, hey, you can reuse this and po please put it in your cache. But setting a proper cache control header doesn't necessarily mean that the browser won't request this file again. So for example, what happens when you hit a refresh in your browser, usually what browsers do is they make a request and then the server will respond with, yo, the file that you have in your cache is still good. Please go with this one. But when you're now, for example, requesting a style sheet, this could still, this little uh, revalidation could still block the rendering. So what you can do too is you can set an immutable cache directive here. And this is, for example, what Facebook does. Because on sites like Facebook, fa people are just refreshing all the time. Even this validation of the cache and still things are valid, um, takes them time. So with Immutable, you can really tell the browser, hey, whatever happens, you don't have to revalidate this file. Because what we usually do is that we ship um, hashed assets anyways. We ship styles.filedependenthash.css, right? There doesn't need to happen this revalidation. So the support for Immutable is not that great, but you can set that and maybe you can speed up a few website visits for a few users. And I think that is a an easy fix or an easy thing to do for shipping better websites. So caching by itself is a very hard topic. So if you want to learn more about this, I really like this article by Harry Roberts. It was called, called Cache Control for Civilians. And it goes into a lot of more directives like no store, no cache, must revalidate. Um, so caching by itself is hard. So if you want to learn more, I highly recommend to have a look um, at this resource to um, save some requests on the wire but it is also about sending the right data in the first place. So for example, what happens when you hit a URL into the address bar of your browser is that the browser will also send this request header, accept and encoding. And this header will tell the server what compression algorithms um, the browser understands. And you see there gzip, deflate, and br. So these are different compression algorithms. And I went uh, onto my computer and I had a look at an example. So I got the style sheet, which was 100K as uh, uncompressed. Then I compressed it with gzip, which brought it down to 15K. And then I compressed it with broadly, which was the BR in there, 
and compressed it down to 10K, which brought me a five kilobyte file saving. And I get it, five kilobytes, kilobytes is maybe not a lot of data to save, but depending on what project you're working on, this can make a huge difference. For example, here you see an example that Wikipedia basically shaped down nine kilobytes of their JavaScript payload, which led them to save 1.4 terabytes of transferred data per day. And I think this is just a very beautiful statistic. So sometimes that's the little wins. So when we look at these kind of three things, you could now save 5K on the wire. But when you talk about broadly, what a lot of times happen is that people are like, but Stefan, broadly compression is so slow. And this is basically comparing apples and oranges. So let's have a just brief look about gzip and broadly compression. gzip by itself has nine compression modes. Broadly has 11. The default mode of these was chosen with two different goals. The default mode of gzip is a fast compression time with good file savings. Whereas the broadly default is maximum, the goal of broadly supported compression is maximum file savings. This is why broadly tends to be way slower than gzip. When you tweak the broadly settings just a little bit, you will find out that broadly tends to compress with a better um, result on the same speed which I think is very, very nice. But when you think about compression, you also have to think about that you don't have to compress on the fly. So how you enable usually gzip is that you go into Nginx and you um, enable plugin and whenever a request comes in, it will be dynamically on the fly um, be compressed. What you could do is you could also just put it into your build pipeline because JavaScript pipelines right now or web development pipelines these days have a build process anyways. So maybe you can pre-generate the broadly compression to not do it on the fly to get the maximum file sizes. If you want to learn more about this topic, um, this article by Akamai, it's a little bit older, but it's still a very, very good read and I highly recommend um, to have a look if you want to learn how to get rid of a few bytes on the wire. So the support for broadly is pretty good too. And when you look around, you see that Facebook, Dropbox, all the big ones are shipping broadly because five or 10 kilobytes matter to them. Text assets are not the biggest thing for the data that we have on the web though. The biggest problem that we have is media, right? It's images and video. And this is where we spend all the data on the wire. And when you want to be uh, ship good uh, images, it might be that you come up with a picture element like this. What you see there is a picture element that also checks for support of WebP. WebP is this image format by Google, which tends to be a little bit smaller than uh, JPEG. And it's also doing uh, responsive images with sending proper cropped images depending on the viewport sizes. This is terrible. This is hard to maintain. It doesn't look great. But guess what? The, the browser also sends an accept request header when it requests an image. And it will tell you that it supports, for example, different image formats. So, so you see here that the browser in this case supports WebP, PNG, and other formats. So what is the support today for WebP, just as a little side note? Well, Safari didn't join the party yet, um, but we're getting there. The thing that I want to tell you is that the browser gives you the information on what image formats it understands. And then you compare it with something like this. <clears throat> so what you see there is an accept CH. CH stands for client hints. Um, a header on the server side, and you're tell telling the browser here, hey, please tell me the laid out image width and the viewport width of your assets in the next 100 seconds. And what happens then is that the browser will make requests and will include viewport width and the image width. To make that work, your images have to have a sizes property so that the browser knows how the image will be laid out. And when you then get the image request, including its request headers, you will get the information on what are image formats are supported and how wide is the image? Plus, this takes a uh, screen resolution into consideration too. And then you could ship tailored media using your server, some server logic, or even put it into a service worker. If you want to learn more about client hints, um, uh, Jeremy Wagner does a lot of good stuff about this, so I highly recommend to check that out. But you have to be a little bit careful with this one right now. Because client hints basically um, give uh, tracking mechanisms another way to fingerprint and to another way to recognize people. So there is a lot of privacy concerns going on with client hints, which is why I wouldn't recommend using it today. Um, but I'm still very excited and I hope that we've figured it out very soon. 
And then there was also something interesting happening just one month ago, which makes me a little bit optimistic that client hints still could happen. So I don't know if you've seen that, but Google basically wants to get rid of the user agent string. So in case you don't know, the user agent string is a request header that identifies your browser with a lot of uh, conf uh, information about what browser, what operating system, and a lot of lies, because uh, we had browser wars in the past. And the way they envision this feature is that browsers should in the future only send this request header, which is sec client hands and user agent. And if the server is interested in learning more, they're proposing to reuse the accept ch header, which then leads to additional request headers that are sent um, by the browser. And I hope that this will bring back discussions about the initial client hits feature, because I think that would be very cool. Here we are very cutting edge, so, um, but I would watch the space because I think that's cool. With this, you could tailor media. But I think it's also important to give users and visitors a way to kind of give you as a website builder the information that they want to save data. So there's also this request header that you can enable in your operating system. So in, on Android, you can turn on save data in the main settings. Or for example, in Chrome, you can uh, enable Chrome Lite. And then the browser will start sending the save data on header. This information then is also available in, in JavaScript land using Navigator connection save data. And with this, we could now start shipping tailored experiences like, for example, Twitter does. Twitter ships a Datenspar-Modus, uh, which lazy loads um, images and ships a little bit less of everything when you enable this. The sad part about this is, though, that they do not recognize the save data header and the save data feature, which is completely missing the point. So what I want to tell you is that let's please use the platform instead when we uh, build these nice for the user features. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful when you play around with Chrome safe data though, because Chrome does what Chrome does. When you enable Chrome Lite in your mobile Chrome, it could be that they ship you proxy pages that they optimize for your usage because Google thinks that they know better how to make a fast internet that the people build in websites. And they might be right, but I'm not sure how I, be, how I feel about this whole proxying approach. If you don't, if you want to play around with safe data and you don't want Google to proxy your websites, you have to adjust the cache control that you set to no transform to tell Google no way that you will proxy my website. Uh, speaking about Chrome Lite, they will also enable lazy loading of images when you have data saver enabled, which I think is cool. But it brings up the question on, how much should browsers optimize and how much should developers optimize? The thing here is that browsers um, cannot know everything uh, about the user and they, cannot, they can only optimize to a certain extent. So for example, a good example is, um, is Shopify. They reduce their page rate by 13% if they discover the safe data header because they're just shipping a little bit of different content depending on the user preferences. And I think this is very cool. And it also showed that 20% of Indian and Brazilian requests actually include safe data, which I think is very astonishing and surprising. So if you want to learn how to um, ship different experiences uh, recognizing safe data, I can recommend this article. And I would really love to see more people playing around with this because less data doesn't have to mean a lesser experience. You could ship low resolution images. You could ship fewer images. You could ship the carousel that nobody cares about. You could avoid loading fonts. There are many ways to really save kilobytes and maybe megabytes on the wire if the user asks for it. So if we go to the responsible.dev slash affordable, you will see that uh, first of all, I'm shipping boldly. This is deployed, uh, deployed on Cloudflare, um, which is nice. And then you will see that there is this header JPEG, which is requested, but I'm shipping a WebP image because I'm working with the request header that tells me that WebP is supported. And then also when I uh, resize the browser window, you will see that the uh, shipped or the re responded image becomes smaller because this site asks Chrome to set client hints uh, which I then can use to uh, tailor the image on the server side, which I think is a very nice th thing um, to have. And I can't wait to have a proper solution for this because this gives us a way to optimize for the users. And I think this is important because the web is really with us every day today. 
And unfortunately, we hit kind of this state of the web today. And I'm not responsible for building the whole thing, but over my 10 years web development experience, I built parts of this. And I have to say that we're slowly messing it up because I think that the web should be respectful. And the biggest thing that we should respect is probably time. So we can optimize how things are loaded in our websites. So what you could do is you could use a so-called preload directive, which you can use as a li link element in your HTML or as a header. And with this, you can give the browser some information of things that it will request in just a few seconds. This is perfect to load uh, additional critical resources and fonts to kind of improve the experience. If you use this, you have to be a little bit careful though, because certain CDNs and uh, proxies um, transform a uh, rel preload link header to an HTTP2 push. So you should always use it with a no push directive. But overall, this is a great way to speed up critical resources um, to improve the experience just a little bit. And the support is also pretty decent today, so you can start shipping that today. And then there's also one thing that I'm very, very excited about, which is basically the AMP reaction. In case you don't know, AMP is this framework by Google that pretends to make the web faster and it highly um, relies on JavaScript and they are basically limiting what is allowed in websites. And two or three years ago, I was giving this talk about AMP. I'm not the biggest fan of AMP, but I think technically it's very interesting. And when AMP was released, all these people that were working on specs and building the web platform itself were like, oh, this is not good. We need to come up with a standard solution to kind of disallow things that are possible in the web. And now in 2020, we have this. So for example, what you see there is the feature policy response header. And with this, you can disallow things that should be possible in the website. And it's very, very granular. You, you can dis, uh, disallow camera, MIDI, microphone, uh, re, uh, location requests, all these things that are so annoying. We're still cutting edge here, but you can use that. And if the browser understands it, it understands it. And there are two things in there that I'm very excited about, which is unoptimized images and unsized media. So let me just tell you a story of a side project of mine. So what you see there is tiny helpers of death. And when you reload this on a spotty connection, you will find out that the uh, layout is very jumpy because the images are kicking in. This was the markup for this. And uh, the images have in CSS max width 100%. Uh, but the browser doesn't know the aspect ratio of these kind of images. So quick fix that works now for a few months is to bring back the width and the height attribute of images. With this, browsers will today um, uh, calculate the aspect ratio to get rid of these jumpy pages. So by just defining width and height, the overall experience is way better. And this today works in uh, Edge, Chromium, and Firefox. So Chromium and Firefox browsers. So today, it's a, it is a best practice to define the width and height, again, to avoid jumpy pages. And why am I telling you this? This is also covered in uh, the uh, feature policy header. So what you see there is that I installed a Chrome extension and I enabled, oops, I enabled feature policy um, to not load uh, images without uh, image and height attributes, that to not load too big images. This is great for your development server or for your staging server to kind of notice and disallow media when it is too big and it is not following best practices. And you can then use a reporting observer, which is part of the reporting API that I showed earlier, to react to these kind of violations. And maybe you want to ping them back to a monitoring service, uh, um, uh, additionally to reading them in your console. And it's also working with the report to header. So if you want to kind of measure what is going on, um, you can set that response header too. Tim Cadillac wrote a very, very, very nice article about this one um, if you want to learn more. And then you can disallow all the things that should be possible in your website. And it works for iframes. And there's a JavaScript uh, API available too. So you can start playing around with this too. And it, the support is also, uh, it's, it's not there yet, but for example, for Chrome, you can um, play around with this and use it today. So when we go to the responsible.dev slash respectful, you will find out 
that the permission dialog uh, check is gone because I disallowed it with feature policy. And you will also find out when you look at the waterfall diagram that this one image, the Web Unleash JPEG, was loaded on a second um, position because I set a link preload header um, to kind of show that this one is important. So overall, building for the web is very, very hard today. You have to consider so many things, and this list is far away from being complete. So it's very, very tough. So how can you guarantee that you ship good stuff for the web? So first of all, tooling got also a little bit, little bit better. Chrome now ships with, in the audits panel with a tool that is called Lighthouse. And you can put that in and monitor your website using Lighthouse. And it usually gives you a lot of recommendation on how to build a better thing for the web. It's not taking headers so much into consideration. But then there's also a tool that is called WebHint, which is built by Microsoft. And this is the most picky tool ever. Um, so I highly recommend um, to have a look at this one. If you want to get a more complete overview about headers, uh, I also wrote this article, which is the written form of this talk. For CSP headers and security headers, I highly recommend to check out securityheaders.com. My friend Shep maintains this slide deck, which is a different approach of the headers thing and highly recommend it. And Andrew Betts, I have to speed up a little bit, and Andrew Betts uh, gives this talk, which is called Headers for Hackers, uh, which is also highly recommended. So to close the thing, I really think that the web has to be safe because it shouldn't be possible that you, I, my parents, my friends uh, are mining cryptocurrency without knowing it. I think that the web has to be affordable because depending on the situation where people are, a few kilobytes and especially a few megabytes might matter to the people. And I think that the web should be respectful because nobody likes permission dialogues that, uh, that are out of context. Nobody likes annoying people around to, to have a annoying people around them. So I think that the web has to be safe, affordable, and respectful so that it really is for everybody. And thank you very much.